I'm really excited to present our next presenter, uh, who is really got a really cool background. There, it, it's it's varied but incredibly focused at the same time. You know, he's the president and CEO of World Affairs Council, and they were really the uh, responsible for the daily operations of international, you know, nonprofit organizations as well as you know, economic investment. You give it a huge, uh, huge kind of insight into the world of international business as well as you know his next position, which was the regional manager of Enterprise Florida, and now you know he's the president of West Wing Group. You know, and they provide consulting, warehousing, and fulfillment services to companies. You know, bringing the products into the United States from overseas. But he also has a great perspective on you know products from overseas coming into the U.S. So thank you so much for your time, Max. Absolutely, thanks, Joel. So. The first thing I wanted to talk about are really what are some of the challenges that you know a, a company from the U.S. would face when selling into other countries. Sure. So one of the biggest challenges that we see on the international scene for U.S. companies trying to sell into foreign markets is you know it's very competitive. There's a lot of low-cost goods on the international market. You're dealing with uh, products and services from that country. A lot of countries are very protectionist in some of their uh, some of their products and services. And so, what we have to do is we have to try to break those barriers with with U.S. companies. So, you know, when you see a U.S. product, you think the number one thing you think of is quality. But the problem, though, is is a lot of people their budgets are not as big as the U.S. budget. You know, the per capita income, the GDP income of a country. So, what we have to do is we really have to find the key decision makers. Um, at the higher levels to say this is a quality product, this is going to last a lot longer, and this is the product that you need. Um, you know, so one of the biggest challenges we face uh, on the international market as in a U.S. market is uh, competing against a lower cost good or a, a lower value good product in a foreign market that could be comparable to our product. Now, I've heard that the made in USA products are selling incredibly well in Asia right now. Um, do you have any suggestions for people that have a made in USA product that want to sell into those countries? Yeah, in, in fact, when we go to trade shows overseas, uh, in my in my past careers, we've gone to trade shows overseas, and the first place that you look at and you go to is the U.S. Pavilion or the American Pavilion at a trade show. A great example of that is a show like uh, Medica, which is the largest medical device show in the world. Um, there are a number of people that literally the first thing they do is walk to the U.S. Pavilion or walk to the American section and look for quality products and look for the new revolutionary product on the market. So some of the things that we talk about, especially in the Asian markets, where you're now seeing people in the lower class move into a middle class. And in fact, China uh, in India will have some of the largest middle class coming up here in the next 20 years. So you're seeing a great influx of people who don't want to buy poorly made goods. They want to buy a good quality product. And that's why you're seeing Apple um, in China more. You're seeing you know, Microsoft in China. You're seeing cars now in, in these markets that are higher luxury cars or middle market cars for us. But for them, that's a luxury product. So we're seeing a lot more of that in the market. So some of the things that I think we could, we could really focus on are you need to be in the market and you need to be at these shows meeting with people who are local distributors or who are local uh, reps for the market. Start talking about your product and the quality aspects of your product, the long term uh, durability of your product compared to a foreign product and that really helps sell the product. You have to be there, that's the number one thing. You can't just sit on the sidelines and say, love to sell into the market, but you actually have to be in the market. Um, they're visiting you know, every year, every couple of years just to talk to people and get to know people in the market. Showing up as 100% of the sale. Yeah, so. right? So I show, <laughs> that's it. It's not 90%, it's actually 100% yeah. of the sales. So. so as far as you know, working with uh, China, yeah. On the other side of the coin, if I wanted to bring in a Chinese product into the U.S., what should I know about working with Chinese manufacturers? So there's some interesting things about Chinese manufacturers. First of all, uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, looking at you know sites like Alibaba and you know some of the other trading sites. You actually have to find the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. You sometimes get on those websites, you get the trading partner, as they call it, and you don't actually get the manufacturer where you can actually go inspect the goods. So if you're working with a Chinese partner who is the manufacturer of the product, you want to go look at the factory and see what kind of facility they have there. So um, if you're ordering samples, that's great, and you're kind of looking at products, you want to kind of get the samples and go, okay, this looks good. I'd love to take a trip over and meet the actual manufacturer. 
see their working facilities, see how they're making the goods, and judge that against your knowledge of you know the American manufacturing process, mm-hmm. um, and see what products work really well for you. You know, there's some products. You know, a great example is the fidget spinners that were out. You know, that's a great retail product that yeah. went like hot on the market. The guy who brought the first set a batch of retail uh, fidget spinners into the US literally went over to the factory and said I'll take an order right there but he met face to face with the actual manufacturer cut out the trading partner as they call it and went right into the operations so you get a better deal if you work right with the manufacturer if you're ordering a higher quantity um, but you also get to know the actual quality of the product and see the manufacturing for a process um, if they are a reputable chinese company they will welcome you with open arms for tea and a tour of the manufacturing floor. Mm-hmm. Um, we've heard that a number of times from companies that they said they were welcomed, uh, they were picked up at the airport and they are brought over there and they had a great time, but they were really interested in buying the product from the company and that's what you have to do. You have to be sincere. You can't just go over right. searching, uh, but you have to be sincere that you're interested in their product. That's a great advice. You know, I've seen more and more where you know, the gap between Chinese-made uh, products and the gap between American-made product is getting a lot narrower. You know, yep. what have you seen on your end as far as that gap, and can you tell the the reason for it? Is it that you know they're getting more expensive, or we're getting cheaper? <laughs> I think it actually might be a combination of both. But I think that the the Chinese the Chinese manufacturer is getting uh, better. I mean, they're always going to get better, right? They they started at such a, a bar. They're always going to get better. They, they're never going to be, um, at least in our our knowledge, they're never going to be the American or the German manufacturer and everything. But they are getting better as they develop the products, get more in knowledge. You know, as more and more countries start putting factories into China, um, Volvo, uh, uh, Foxcom, everybody's starting to move operations into China. Um, but you're also seeing some of the higher quality. So. What you're seeing in China and especially in Asia, a lot of that lower quality manufacturing is moving to other markets. So Cambodia, Laos, you know, Thailand, some of the other markets. But that higher quality stuff is still staying there because the workers are trained now right. to make a higher quality product. So you're seeing an increase in that. It's still not to the level yet of you know an American made product, but it's getting better and better all the time as more American companies move into the market. Um, you're going to see more and more better quality products. Uh, in the marketplace. That's interesting, you because know, one of our members had a question, you know, if they wanted to start selling into other countries, you know, just in general other countries, South America, Europe, wherever, mm-hmm. you know, who should they talk to first? You know, what's that first step into, uh, you know, exploring, uh, exporting? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so if you are an American-made product, there's two categories to this. If you're actually making a product in another market, um, there are some ways to help with that. Uh, you know, we can help with that and set you up with some people. There's trade commissioners from those certain countries that you can meet with. Um, every major market, uh, a city in the United States, has a trading partner for. It's called a trade commissioner for Brazil, trade commissioner for such and such country, and you can actually meet with them and say, "This is my product." Um, I'd like to, you know, go into your market. There's, you know, look at the one thing we talk about when we first talk to companies is look at the U.S.'s trading partners. So if you are an American-made product, look at who we have good trade relations with, and that would mean we have an actual trade agreement, free trade agreement. Um, there are 20 countries around the world that have a free trade agreement with the U.S. right now, hmm. and so you can start with those markets. Um, a great resource for a U.S. company is to go to the U.S. Commercial Service website. Type in the country in the U.S. Commercial Service website and look up the trade reports for that country. So let's say you have, let's say you have a uh, a product like a candy bar or a product like a toothbrush. I mean, just give you a, a hint. They will go. You can go onto the U.S. Department of Commerce's website, uh, uscommerce.gov or commerce.gov. Type in the country and it will give you a country report. And there's actually people on the ground that are U.S. employees that are doing product market research. Interesting. So they're actually doing research on what products are hot in a certain market at a certain time. So for Brazil, one of our big uh, markets where it's very hard for a U.S. company to get into, it's very difficult. They're very protectionist, but they do like products that they don't actually make. So if you make a product that Brazil doesn't make, you have a pretty good end of the market. But if you have a product that Brazil makes, it's a little tougher. But they do product reports saying what is the thing that that Brazil needs in the information technology space, in the retail goods consumer space. So we actually, you can read those reports and say, I really want to know more. 
and then talk to a local uh, U, uh, U.S. Department of Commerce trade representative in your market. And those are based all over the United States. There's uh, just in the state of Florida, where we are, there are seven offices for the U.S. Department of Commerce. And you wow. can go talk to one of them and say, I have an American-made product. I'd like to get into this market. What do I do? And they'll start leading you down the road of, hey, you need to do this, this, and this. Okay. Um, I, 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 I'm sorry. Yeah, and then the next step is you, you go, you know, you kind of need to figure out if you want to go to the market. Mm -hmm. So, Are there any other organizations uh, that we should know about to help grow the business internationally? So there are a few. I mean, obviously, it, it, the trading commissioners for certain markets, that's a great way to start. Right. The next place you want to start is uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Commerce. And then there's also what's called the World Trade Centers. Um, a partner organization to when I worked at the World Affairs Council was the World Trade Center organization for the United States. Another great resource if you're trying to find a new market uh, in a new country. There are World Trade Center offices in every major city around the world that you can kind of call and say, I'd like to know a little bit more information about the market and they will do some research for you. One of the things that you'll need is um, a, a letter of certificate of origin for some of these markets and World Trade Centers actually can offer that service. So a certificate of good manufacturing, a certificate of free sale, and a certificate of origin. Some of the things that they can do to help you succeed in business. Um, another great resource is the Chambers of Commerce. So if you're wanting to sell to Brazil and you are based in Austin, Texas, or in Dallas, Texas, there's a Brazilian Chamber of Commerce. You can go talk to them. Um, they will kind of give you some guidelines and say, hey, I'm interested in selling to Brazil. What do I need to do? Um, they might even have an, an event happening every six months that's selling into Brazil. Hmm. So uh, there's ways to do that. You know, we, we try to help people in the, in the most efficient way possible. And that is really working with the, the U.S. Department of Commerce uh, and working with these different trade offices around the world that can actually, that, that their job is to do this for you. Um, there are other nuances to the business which we really help with uh, negotiating um, the the p terms and packages are some of the things that we really help with with a client. But those are some of the basic free resources that you can get um, that will really help you succeed and say, okay, is this the next step I want to take? That's excellent advice. You know, and you touched on something earlier where you said, you know, the U.S. government has boots on the ground in a lot of these countries that kind of talking about the opportunities, but. How can how can somebody size up you know local competition you know that's already there? So there actually is a resource from the U, uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce. It's a, a partner partner in country uh, adjustment that they do. So they will actually look at your product <clears throat> and see help you do a market analysis in a, in a market. Uh, it's a very generic look at the market to see who is already there. Um, but the the Really, one of the things you can do is, you know, look at your competitors to where they have offices. Uh, we do this all the time in some of the medical devices that I've worked with in the past. Uh, you look and say, okay, is my competitor in this market? If not, why? Um, and then you go to the office and say, you know, have you ever had conversations with these guys? You know, we'd love to be in this market. And they go, it's very difficult. This is why that you shouldn't be here. And you go, okay, that's great, a knowledge. But, you know, do some research on your competitors. We do it all the time. That's what we, that's what we focus on is a lot of the research aspects of a product. So say, okay, who are your competitors in the market? Um, who are your U.S. competitors in the market? And if they're not there, why are they not there? But if they are there, what does their market share look like in the market? Right. And so those are some of the great things you can do to size up the market. You know, this is just research you can do online. Um, it's not really hard. I think the in-country in thing costs $500. So if you're looking at uh, where the big sales are in the world for your product, that's some of the things we can do. Um, a way to judge the inflow into a market is to actually look at where the uh, harmonized tariff codes are going. Uh, there's a way we actually can do this for a company. It's very easy to do and you can actually go onto the US uh, Comtrade website and you can actually see inflows into a country for a certain, you know, harmonized tariff schedule. Um, it includes a lot of different products, but you can see, okay, how, how much is going into the market? If not a lot, do you think there's a need? Uh, and that's what we can help do for a company. That's a great first step is to get some market intelligence, say, okay, yes, there are, you know, craft, there's craft beer going into a market. Um, why? Why is it going there? I mean, do they make beer there? Do they not? Who's selling into the market? Um, so there's uh, NAICS codes uh, and harmonized tariff schedule codes that actually match your product code on the international market and you can see trade inflows. 
uh, it's a great resource to look at just for a single market view. Uh, we found for one company that there was no uh, product in their category going into Morocco. Um, Morocco happens to be a free trade country with the U.S. surprisingly. Most people don't know that. Mm. And so we actually helped them uh, do some research and said you should be you should be looking at this market. Uh, they went to a trade show and happened to meet somebody who's a distributor in Morocco that said I'd love to have your product. So working on those angles and finding out you know your top priorities really works well. Now let let's say you know you went to the trade show, you, you met the uh, Moroccan distributor, you know you, you got yep. that all set up. You know how do you figure out logistics? You know are there any good resources? Because you know that's that's a headache in itself, isn't it? Yeah. So if you're a U.S. manufacturer, uh, logistics are so much fun because uh, you, you're actually at a competitive advantage. Uh, really, uh, the first thing we really do is tell people to talk to a local freight forwarder. You know, somebody with knowledge of you know transportation, international shipping, those types of things. Depending on what you're shipping. Now, if you're shipping a 20-foot container or a 40-foot container, um, you might want to talk to a freight shipper. But if you're shipping, you know, by air and it's a small package. Um, and it's a lot of them, and you and it airs the cheapest way or the most viable way, then you just have to talk to DHL or FedEx or somebody like that. That's very easy. But the logistics of it become very simple because a lot of product comes into the U.S. market, but a lot of those ships go back empty. Mm. So getting rate quotes for product going from the U.S. back to some of these major ports of call, you can get a very good rate uh, going overseas. I've seen... Uh, don't quote me on this, but I've seen rates of like $400 for a container to be sent from the U.S. back to China, which is unheard of. I mean, it's $1,800 to $2,000 coming to the U.S. Right. So you can get, a, you know, those ships are going back empty. So if you're putting product on them, it just makes it all more viable as long as you can get it to their port that they're exiting from. Um, if you're going to the West Coast, you want to go through LA or Long Beach. But East Coast, you can go pretty much anywhere. Philadelphia. Jacksonville, Miami, you know, uh, Charleston, Savannah. So you have a lot of different options going to Europe, um, and you have a few options going to the West Coast as well. That's great advice. You know, and going back to our new Moroccan distributor friend, you know, how do we find international partners? This is one of the member questions that we had. You know, if, besides going to a trade show, let's say, you know, are yep. there any other ways to really kind of dip our toe in the water and really start? You know, networking and finding that right partner in the country. Yeah, so there, the, and again, I, I go back to the U.S. Department of Commerce because they do such a great job helping companies find partners. Um, there are, we do some of that work as well, mostly for, uh, for some smaller niche products. Mm -hmm. But really, if you're looking at the market, they will do a market search for you and say if they can find a distributor in the market. Now, the great thing about this is, is they will actually find a list for you and then give you a list. If you don't want to come to the wow. market, but you'd like to just call people, it's not very expensive at all. It fluctuates a little bit. But if you want to actually go to the market and be in market and actually be there for a couple days, let's say you want to go to, let's say you're a U.S. company and you want to go to Morocco mm -hmm. um, and you're thinking, I'm going to make a European vacation trip and I want to do some business while I'm there you can actually go and they will set up meetings for you. Give them about six or eight weeks notice and they'll actually set up meetings with multiple distributors in the market. Oh. And then you can actually meet these people on the ground. Um, it's like $1,000 for a two-day trip. Um, and then you can also talk to the World Trade Centers. They do the same thing as well. Uh, but it's just asking the right questions to the right people and saying, here's my product, here's what I offer, here's my next code. It's made in the USA, so it's freely sold into the Moroccan government. You know, product. Uh, here's certificate of origin, here's certificate of free sale. And if, as long as you have your ducks in a row, they can actually set up meetings for you to meet with the, the distributors. They know who's bringing in product and out of the product out of the, the country. The great thing about this is, another great thing is, usually the people that are working for the U.S. Embassy or the U.S. Commercial Service are Moroccan citizens. Oh, so great. their job is to actually help a, uh, a U.S. company get into the market. They speak the local language, right. they live the local market, mm -hmm. and it's not a U.S. person going over there and spending time saying, I, I know the market. That's a, so anyways, that's, so that's, great advice. That's, a, that's a great way to start. Um, there, there's some great resources on the website. You can actually email them um, for free. You just send them an email and say, I'm interested in this market. What do you think? They might even say, don't even waste your time. They may, they're really that good. They're like, oh, we don't want to waste your time. We don't want to waste our time. It's not going to work. So then you can move on to the next market. But I would pick... You know, if you're a new company starting out, I would look at free trade markets first because you're not going to have to pay duties. In the negotiation process, having the duties and tariffs cut out is 
30% of the battle. Now you're working on inco terms and you know trade terms is it going to be sold here or there what's the deal how much do i get off you know those types of things but that cuts out about 30% of the battle that's fantastic advice you know and that 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 shows a really good scenario yeah. tell me about you know uh, the biggest mistake that you know companies make when when going overseas and what's the, what's the other side of that coin all right so here's the other side of that so you get a call from somebody saying, I'd like to sell your product in this market, right? Mm -hmm. That's the number one thing. It, what starts usually on this path, people calling us or people calling and round and asking for somebody like us to help. I got a call from somebody in this market, you know, we'll pick a country and say, they want to buy our product. What do we do? And I'm like, okay, so what'd you do? Well, we sent them a whole container. I'm like, what were the terms on that agreement? And like, well, they, they said they'll pay us in 90 days. And I'm like, <laughs> no, <laughs> so a lot of things you need to do before this. We had a company that actually wanted to sign up a distributor and said, well, have you checked this guy? And they said, no, we, we just thought he, you know, he wanted to buy the product, so we sent him the product. Well, it turns out he was transshipping that product to another country oh my God. where it was not legal to sell that product in that market. Very good example that has happened more than once. If you're a US company making kitchen timers, you know, the little egg timer that you put on your stove, it is illegal to sell that product into certain countries in the Middle East um, uh, and also in Africa. The reason being is because it can be used in an improvised explosive device. It is actually a forbidden product to sell out of the United States. We had a company that did that and it was transshipped. Well, on the original documents was the US manufacturer. They had no idea what was going on. Obviously, that is a worst case scenario that you never want to see, but we've had a company that had to do that and the U.S. government came knocking on the door and said, we just saw your product entered an illegal country where it's not legal to sell. Why did you do this? So checking on your partner in the market is a very good idea before you start sending containers. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of times your international sales team uh, will just go, I got a great sale, let's go. There's a lot of background checks that as an American citizen, we have to take into account yeah. um, and it's it's more difficult for us than other markets but there's a lot of uh, rules about this about shipping around the world and different things like that so knowing who you're selling to in a market is just as important as getting an actual sale um, and you know they could be shipping it somewhere else or they could be taking your product shipping it to China remanufacturing it and then selling it and you're like what happened I was like well we bought we bought a whole bunch and we destroyed 99% of it trying to figure out how to make this product and then now we're selling it for a third of the price. So knowing who your person is in the market is very important and getting a kind of a background check on them. Um, and then having somebody actually set up appointments with these people. So having the US government call you saying, I have an American company, they're not gonna make a mistake and try to you know, dissuade you. They're gonna do a, a pretty good job of meeting with you. And the US government, you know, they're setting up the meeting. So it's on them as well if the meeting goes well or not. So we've had a, all different scenarios where they've signed agreements and then never committed money. Um, there's been times when the banks could not do a, uh, you know, a letter of credit, uh, paying for the goods. You know, there's some things you need to think about. But if a company starts with the 20 countries that we have a free trade agreement with, they're gonna, it's gonna start off wonderfully. They're gonna have a, a good time doing it because all the kinks have already been worked out between the two governments. And so your product has a, a very good chance of being in that market. Well, I did ask for the other side of the coin. So. Yeah. <laughs> The way other side of the coin that we've seen, and, it, and there are you know smaller cases where you know you didn't get paid right on time, it took time to get paid or something like that. But there are ways to manage that risk uh, on the international transactions as well. How would a company uh, based out of the U.S. you know uh, perform a SWOT analysis or a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, analysis against a competition uh, in a country in another country? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And I actually, when, when you sent me uh, when you sent me an idea of what this was going to be, I've tried to think about this from from that perspective. So, the strength of a market, um, you want to look at two things: uh, local market, how how strong is their middle class, um, what is their consumer spending level in the market, and that's all free information you can actually find on the web. You can look at Wikipedia, you can look at just a country's market, you can see their their, uh, their GDP or their in their per person spending level. The US has one of the highest in the world. I think it's still the highest over everybody and China is slowly rising up to meet them. So if your product is a, on the more expensive side, 
you need to think about those factors. You're not your product might not sell very good in a country with a very low with a very low per person discretionary income. Uh, but if it has a higher discretionary income, you're going to see a better return on on your investment in the market. So your strength compared to your local market is your quality better. Um, are are they having issues in the local market? And that's all just by talking to somebody. Hey, would our products sell really well? And they go, oh yes, you know, or this local company doesn't do a very good job making the product and it always breaks or something like that. Or or they might say, you know what, They're, the local market person is doing a great job and you know, there's really nothing there. You know, there's really, they really own the market. So you would have to figure out how to price your product even lower than theirs to get it in. There's always going to be somebody that would want to distribute your product, but it's going to be based on price. Is there going to be a, a big key factor um, depending on how the local competition is. Um, and so your your strengths in that, your weaknesses as a U.S. company um, really are the fact that you have to ship your product to a market depending on the size and weight, and it could be 30 days to get a product there, and you're going to have to sit on product for a while. Um, you know, a lot of your local distributors in a foreign market are going to ask for net 90 or net 120 uh, to start making payments back, and that can be difficult. There are ways to get around that, though, so that's, that's <laughs> fine. But, you know, that's the way what we, we talk about now the opportunities of a market are if you see, if you're looking in your in your forecast and you see that their growth potential is going up and up and up. So every year their discretionary income is, is up and up and up. Mm -hmm. Start thinking about planting the seeds now for future sales. Getting a team on the ground that you know of that you're just having email conversations with, saying hi to every once in a while, being friends with, you know, when they come to the US, you invite them to your factory, you invite them to dinner or lunch when they're here. And just have a meeting, you know, in the in the U.S. market. If they're in the U.S. for for a show or something like that, and they want to come visit you, as long as they pay for it, and, and you can just you know invite them to your shop. But you know, you want to think about that as your long term, you know, opportunities. The international selling game is not a short term, quick term fix. It's not a you know overnight dropship. It's a it's a long perspective uh, in a local market. Um, and then the threats. Um, you have to look at political threats in a local market. You have to look at how stable is their government. Um, and you also have to look how stable is their trading partners. Are they in a place where they're going to be locked in the middle of a, of a, of a zone that could be in conflict in, in the near future? So those are some of the things you need to think about on a SWOT analysis perspective. Uh, a great example of the opportunities. Uh, we were in Thailand, uh, no, sorry, Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, a year ago uh, on a trip. And one of our companies that we were with, we took a few companies over uh, to Taiwan, he had to leave a day early. The reason he had to leave a day early is he was going flying back to the U.S. and flying to Brazil to go to his major distributor in uh, Brazil and Argentina's daughter's quinceanera. <laughs> now, to a to a U.S. person, they might not think that, but that's kind of a big deal in those markets to be invited to go to one of those things. So he made the effort to go all the way down there and talk to the guy who's bringing him a lot of business in Argentina and Brazil, just to fly back there to go be present in their lives. So that's your opportunities. You know, keeping those opportunities open, being willing to um, know about their family uh, before you do any business deal in a market. You know, the first thing they do in a foreign market, a lot of the times, if you're if you're Latin and you're you're listening to this conversation, you know about this. That you're never going to talk about business until they've talked about your family, your favorite soccer team, and how your kids are doing in school, <laughs> um, and then they talk about business. You know that type of thing. So those are some of the things you need to think about on the opportunity side. It's always about build. It's always about building relationships. So. That's excellent advice. And it, you know, if you could leave us with, you know, what is the one thing that you know we can do today to really prepare our business for success this year? You know, if we're looking to go international, what can we do to dip our toe in the water and get started today? Yeah. So the one thing you can do today is figure out where you figure out where you, make a short list of markets that you want to visit and that markets that you think are potential. Mark that down on a list. Go to, to uh, look up the U.S. free trade com uh, countries, look up their list and say, I'd really like to start working on five countries this year. So today, um, you know, after you're watching this and you're done, go on to the U.S. Department of you know, Trade's website, uh, International Trade, and see who are our free trading partners and say, I'd like to start looking at potential in those markets. Um, if it's an American-made product, if you're making a product overseas, there's some other things we have to talk about um, that we can mention you know, later on in, in the chat section. but. If you're an American-made product, that's what you need to do today is say, I want to look at these five markets. Pick some markets that have uh, potential, mm -hmm. but also pick some markets that are very stable and see what the opportunities are in those markets. 
Um, you're not going to be able to go visit all five of those this year. I, we, we understand that. But pick some and start narrowing it down by what you think is the best opportunities for your product. And then look at trade shows in the market. You know, Ask somebody when the next trade show is for retail products in uh, Canada. Great example, you know, a market that's really close for U.S. companies. Mexico, another market that's really close. You can go to a trade show and just start meeting people and start networking. We'll walk the floor. Um, you'll be surprised how many trade shows actually you can get in for free. And then just, you know, walk the show floor for a day and then say, great, I had a great weekend here in Mexico City and now I'm back to the U.S., but I've gained some on-the-ground market intelligence. So start picking those ones out that are really close to you and then go from there. Um, and then there's a lot of resources that we can walk through and help you kind of navigate uh, on the international scale that can really work for you and help your business. I, I appreciate you lending your advice. You know, I know we're just dipping our toe in the water here, but you know, yeah. this is such a it's such an amazing opportunity for you know U.S. companies to be able to explore this, uh, especially when you know, we're talking about differentiating uh, between countries. I know I know how complicated it can be sometimes. So yeah. thank you so much for uh, bringing the perspective. Absolutely, thank you so much, Joel.